Psychic powers and their exploitation at the hands of institutions have been a trope since the mid-1970s. Horror, and by extension the thriller, is an inherently political genre, and it's telling that, over the last 50 years, our distrust of government, education, and business has manifested in the assumption that someone, somewhere, is waiting to exploit our talent. I mean, this movie is just about getting Carrie Wurrer naked and doing some standard TV mystery stuff along the way. But those other things are fun to talk about, right? Wurrer plays Lila Reed, an art student who gets a work-study position in the psych department with Dr. Ian Burton, played by Eric Roberts. He tells Lila that she'll just be sharing her own experiences, but secretly Burton is studying psychometry, the ability to read facts or emotions by touching objects. To the script's credit, Burton does have a scientific explanation for why that might be. He demonstrates with a pottery vase and a laser show. Okay, these lasers act like a CD. They transform pattern vibrations into electronic signals that produce sound. Only in this case, the Chang is our disc. Can you hear it? Yeah. I think we're hearing the actual conversations of the potters at the time this vase was created over 600 years ago. I mean, for the time it was a theoretical load of crap, but it gives my brain enough to hang its hat on so I can go along for the ride. Burton gives Lila objects to take home and feel to see if she can receive any vibrations. First up, a set of pantyhose from which she receives visions of a young woman preparing for sensual sex. Lila tells Burton that she doesn't know whether it was a real vision or just her imagination. She asks for a second assignment to see if she can push it further. While at his apartment, oh, uh, he asks her to come over to his apartment to get her assignment. But he's got a girlfriend, I'm sure it's fine. While at his apartment, Lila has a vision of Burton doing some sort of kinky, painted crotch dance. She's able to shake that off faster than I was, but she continues to have visions of the woman, this time accompanied with the sensation of fear. Next up is a silver compact that yields a reflection of the woman. Yeah, I'm not sure what anyone else would expect from that. Lila starts sketching the woman's face on her easel, which is good because she had artist block earlier in the film. At night, Lila is haunted by dreams of the woman's face. I find it interesting that we had a concrete cinematic language for nightmares, the wrinkled sheets, the overhead angle shot through the whirling fan, the waving, distended shadows. But we hadn't yet come up with a good cinematic portrayal of internal logic of nightmares. Director Brian Grant just stretches the edges of the screen, but that's not particularly scary, nor disorienting. The next morning, hey, it's the Netflix building! The next morning, Lila goes looking at the dead woman's apartment. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's not a spoiler for anyone who's been paying attention. Of course it's a dead woman. She presses Burton on whether or not he knew her, but he admonishes her to stop trying to figure things out intellectually and instead just follow her feelings. Lila furiously finishes her painting of the woman, going topless in bib overalls and rubbing paint on her naked breasts. Poor college student can't even afford a shirt. I'm sure the socioeconomic commentary there was intentional. She's now hearing voices calling to her in the bath, but that may be a product of the severed head in the sink. Lila ignores Burton's admonition and finds out the young woman was named Carrie Reiner, and that Ian was carrying on an affair with her. He was even brought in for questioning, but released for lack of evidence. Microfish don't lie, Ian. Lila quits and tries to go back to life as a student, even going so far as to go out on a date with her regular luster Denny, a guy so twitchy he makes Eddie Redmayne look like Cary Grant. Denny shows her the tenant and extols the virtues of Roman Polanski, which is the biggest romantic red flag of the film, and the other male lead has been giving her his dead lover's personal items, so that's saying something. Now, but Polanski, he is a genius, okay? Okay. Sure enough, after some perfunctory chit-chat, Denny starts pawing at her. Lila shoves him off and sends him away. Her friend Marianne thinks it's because Lila has the hots for Dr. Ian, and Lila is indeed having sexual visions about him. Thankfully, no painty crotchy this time.
Lila returns to Ian's apartment after his girlfriend leaves and asks for her job back. She wants him, as her professor, to teach her how to use her psychic abilities for good, thus making this the sexiest Xavier Jean Grey slash fiction ever written. He offers to help her if they keep things professional and jokes that they will not be having sex. Okay. But this is just work like your other studies, okay? Strictly scholastic. Mm -hmm. No sex. Dude, the last student you slept with wound up murdered, and you were a suspect. You sure that's something you want to joke about? I mean, even if it turned out fine, should a professor be joking with a student about the possibility of having sex with her? We're not gonna hide it anymore. <laughs> you are so fired. Lila takes home more of Carrie's lingerie and puts it on, an act that makes her feel super sexy, so we get a strip tease in the middle of Lila's apartment. Hey, I'm glad Carrie Wurr finally got to feel sexy for the first time in her life. She was so frumpy before with the overalls. Remember when thongs were a thing? Those were some interesting years. Possessed by the dress, Lila heads over to Ian's for some sexy time, but to his credit, he rebuffs her because it's inappropriate. She runs home where Denny accosts her outside her door. Let's see if Denny bats for the nice guy cycle here. Relax. Relax, just me. Denny, what are you doing here? Well, we have plans. I've been waiting since nine. We did not have definite plans. I said to call me. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got, I've got Scorsese films here and some comedies. I don't know whether you like... Denny, this is not a good film. time, okay? It's late and I'm tired. Look, Lila, wait. What? Where have you been? What, are you blowing me off? Go home, Denny. You're seeing someone else, aren't you? What's what's the matter with me? Go home, Denny! Lila! And wait for it. Wait for it! Bitch. Lila gives herself a quarantine haircut to match Carrie's from her visions. Don't worry, she wears a beret quite a bit to cover that up. At Marianne's urging, Lila goes to see Detective Pantella, the cop who investigated Carrie's murder. Pantella is played by Ron Perlman and, oh my god, you had Ron Perlman holster this whole time? And you're only pulling the trigger now? Pantella confirms that Burton was her professor, but that there wasn't enough evidence to charge him. Ed Bigley Jr. shows up out of nowhere to hit on Lila while she's out at a bar. I'm not sure if screenwriter Doug Wallace is aware of this, but every guy that's spoken to Lila, minus the detective, has been part of a Russian nesting doll of douchebaggery. We have the guy who is awkward, shy, and nice up until the point that he finds out he's not getting any. Inside him, we have the condescending English major who asks Lila if she's ever heard of Yeats. You just know that if he found out she was an artist, he'd lecture her on Picasso. And inside him, we have the creepy landlord who spies on Lila in the shower. Dr. Burton only escapes this grouping because he refers to it as Chinese yoga instead of Qigong. I Am I interrupting something? Uh, no, no. String a bit of Chinese yoga. Helps to keep me calm. But the fact that he casually drops his yoga routine in the middle of a conversation isn't promising. Lila thinks someone might be stalking her at her apartment, so she sleeps over at Ian's. More sexy dreams, but no sex. Using the opportunity, Lila searches his apartment to find out that Ian is into erotic asphyxia, and that he arranged for her to come to work for him from the beginning. She is suspicious, but... He explains that he has been using her psychic powers to help him solve the mystery of Carrie's death. Actually, I really have to be going. A quick sip, I'll walk you out. Sensation is the store brand version of Jagged Edge, and a number of other psychosexual thrillers from the late 1980s. The Am I in Love with a Killer plot device stretches all the way back to Alfred Hitchcock's suspicion, and it's easy to get mileage out of it by alternating the evidence in each new scene to lend it new meaning. The problem, as with most mysteries, is the only thing that the audience can do is let the film land on is or isn't. The psychometry aspect overwhelms the film at times. While it's a nice twist on the genre and one that was trendy around the time this film was made, it feels more like a convenient plot device to reveal things to characters without too much effort. Unfortunately, since director Brian Grant is more interested in visual style and eroticism, there's not much revealed in these scenes other than Ian and Carrie had a sexually charged relationship. And since there's no new information, the psychic visions come off more like horny fantasies. Brian Grant was mostly known for his work in music videos at this point, and it shows. 
Grant unloads a number of editing and cinematography tricks that are fine for the cinematic language of music videos that are backed by popular music, but he has a much harder time here conveying a narrative. And if that's your thing, fine. Carrie Wurr is a beautiful woman and she does a fine job with an earnest performance in her first major leading role. Grant clearly wanted sex in his erotic thriller, so it makes sense to spend a lot of time looking at Wurr in various states of undress. Nipples aren't characterization, though, and Grant spends way too much time looking at the former and forgets to do the latter. As far as supporting cast go, Ron Perlman does a lot with a little here. In fact, he made me wish this was a detective thriller instead of an erotic mystery. I can only assume that Ed Begley Jr. owed someone a favor, or he rammed someone with his little electric car and didn't have insurance, so the judge ordered him to be in this movie. Whatever the case, he's a name actor in a small against-type role, and he sticks out like a sore thumb. They would have been better off going with a no-name actor giving a worse performance. At least then I would have been focused on the scene instead of wondering if Begley was having financial problems. Sensation debuted on Cinemax before bouncing around HBO's late-night offerings and finally found a following on VHS thanks to Carrie Wurr. It also launched her career as direct-to-video catnip for those viewers who liked their thrillers with a little sex in them, but not so much sex that they were watching Shannon Tweed films. There's not much else to say about Sensation. It's a film that leans into its lurid material and doesn't have the juice plot-wise to back it up. The charismatic, sexy performance from Carrie Wurr keeps it from getting too boring, but the lack of any forward momentum in the narrative means you probably won't find yourself invested in the mystery. Next up, Eric Roberts gets the girl. <laughs> 